Well, that's a tough act to follow, D, and uh, I wish you the best in uh, getting it all working. Um, I just want to first preface my remarks with a word of thanks to the conference organizers for doing this for us. Um, I think it's a great occasion. It's been a fantastic occasion for me. Uh, some of you may know that um, uh, about oh, 20, 20 years ago now, I was deeply involved in a new NASA mission which got canceled about five years ago. <laughs> and so I was looking around myself for something new to do. And um, that's what brought me then uh, to OH and frankly, uh, back to Carl and to some extent also back to Dick, who I've had uh, a knowledge uh, of for some time. So it's, a, it's kind of a fantastic occasion for me to be able to come to this meeting and learn about um, the latest things that have gone on. So before we, we get to open it up to that discussion, I'd just like to say a few things about what really impressed me uh, so far with this meeting. Um, I think we've had some excellent reviews. I can think of the one by Adam Leroy that started the day off really with a bang, I thought, and uh, continued in the midday with uh, Naomi McClure Griffiths uh, review, both of which I, uh, I thought were fantastic. Uh, I'm really impressed by the volume of new data that's coming out. Uh, compared to what we did years ago. Uh, it's quite astonishing. Um, and if I see the extinction maps that Doug Finkbeiner has been talking about and analyzing, and now the H1 survey that Josh Peak is showing us these fantastic movies of, um, I think we're in a, a great era for galactic structure studies coming up. Uh, the volume of new data, of course, is great, but also uh, computers and algorithms have improved, and now we've got better ways of analyzing this data, and that, too, has been extremely impressive to me to see. Um, the display, uh, which Josh has uh, perhaps so uh, aptly shown with the GALFA survey, methods of display. Analysis with Susan Clark, I thought that was a great uh, description too, and uh, Claire Murray's work um, on absorption. All of these things were showing new ways of, of doing um, analysis with uh, large, huge data sets. We would never have dreamed of attacking uh, in this way 20 years ago. So it's all a, a great experience then. Um, there, there are a few things I think that we, we need to remember. Uh, when we're doing these, we, we make lots of pretty pictures. But it's possible to display the data in a way that obscures the reality. Uh, and I'm going to cite one or two examples from my own papers that I don't have to <laughs> even look too far <laughs> to find uh, uh, examples that uh, don't do a good job at it. Uh, this is from a paper which uh, I published with uh, Renzo Sanchisi. Um, I, I hesitate to say how long ago this is. I think this is a 1979 paper. Uh, it shows the uh, distribution of atomic hydrogen along an edge-on galaxy, NGC 891. This is also the distribution of continuum. It was perhaps the first paper that sh tried to show uh, the distribution of H1 in an edge-on galaxy. Uh, you can see underlined here what we did with the contour. We changed, we took the contour values in these odd units here, which says millijanskis per beam, and we turned it into a, a column density, assuming it was optically thin. So all of anything in the red line is wrong. It's all wrong. And the reason is that Millijanskis per beam is about the most insidious mixed unit you could possibly think of. Uh, it really obscures the physics completely. And I'll show you in the next uh, example why that's so. This is a, a new paper coming out. Um, 
in monthly notices where uh, a young student in Holland, uh, uh, Stefan Peters, has analyzed uh, a handful, half a dozen, six to 10 edge-on galaxies in H1. And these are shown in their normal format you might see. And over here, just sort of flattened to make it look a little bit neater. And he came to me first and he said, why are these all flat? And I, I looked at the contour units. They were Milijanskis per beam. I said, why don't you just write them in Kelvins? That's a perfectly good Milijanskis per beam. It's just a physical unit, which makes more sense. So he, he went away with some numbers that I gave him and did the conversion. And here it is. This is the surface brightness all along that disk. It's 100 degrees or very close to that. And I don't, you know, in 20 years, we didn't realize from 20 years of looking at edge on galaxies, we didn't realize that they were all optically thick. And so the idea of looking at this data and making something out of it was impossible without first dealing with the optical depth problem. Now, I'm not accusing anyone of doing anything wrong except me. And so this is just a word of caution that uh, I think the way we think of data and the way we display it does matter. And here's another thing, too, that I have enjoyed very much watching the development of structure in the interstellar medium. This is high opacity structure in the Earth's atmosphere. Right, it's a radar weather map uh, at a fairly high short, or shall we say short wavelengths. And this is a high opacity material in the atmosphere, rain clouds. Here's an example. If you lower the opacity and you look at how big the atmosphere is at much lower opacity values, this is what it looks like. Everything's a lot bigger and the whole area is covered in stuff. And so the morphology that you're going to study then depends very much on the tracer that you use. And so that's the second word of caution that I was about to offer, that uh, it matters not only the units you use, but don't forget that the tracer you use is, is limiting what you can say about it. And if we use a high density tracer like carbon monoxide, you're going to be talking about high density material, whether you know or like it or not. And when we look at lower, lower density material, we'll see a different picture. Well, that kind of brings me then to uh, the next topic I wanted to mention, which is about dark molecular gas, because that is one topic I don't think we've really talked much about here. Dee Lee mentioned it at the end, and that, that's great because the paper he referred to in the Korean Journal of Physics is, or, or of Astronomy is really a great little paper, a very recent paper. And those are examples of tracers that we, we have known since Carl and uh, the, uh, developed the, the, the observational techniques to look at OH and emission. And of course, Dick did a lot of work on structure of OH as a, as a tracer for magnetic fields, which we'll hear more about in the next days. Uh, I'll be focusing a little less on that since we haven't got to that one yet. Okay, I'm not going to go through this at all. I just want to skip through a few pages of this where I can talk about, let's see, something. This is just, I'm pulling bits and pieces of this out. So the, the, the dark gas, we, Isabel Grenier is in the audience, I believe. And she has had a tremendous influence on this field. And in general, this stuff surrounds bright molecular clouds. And uh, we've talked about um, uh, what it could be. It was thought for a while that it might have been uh, 
dense H1, optically thick H1 of the kind that I mentioned earlier. We know now that from Stanimirovich and others that that's not the case. Although this does still make a contribution to the missing gas and mincing baryons in the galaxy. Um, but the major component, of course, is generally thought to be diffuse H2. OK, the state of this gas is clear that it's got to be in some physical state that we haven't uh, been able to detect. It must be in regions where it will not all be dissociated. Otherwise, we would see it in different tracers. It's got to be uh, 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 dust to gas ratios. It needs to be a lumpy medium with a low average um, AV. Uh, and the, the, the CO emission is low either because the abundance is low or because the total volume density is too low, one or the other. It's got to be one or the other. So, so this leads you to pretty well uh, limit yourself as to what this could be. Well, here's the picture we've seen many times. Now the edges, the surfaces of molecular clouds. And we can see in here that uh, there's, a pl there's a very limited range over which this gas could live. It's got to be in that area. So here be the dark gas in this area. And of course, if you think of it, you realize that this, this discussion is usually talks about PDRs, which are things that are on scales of a parsec. But everything to the left of the, with the red arrow going way out there is the rest of the galaxy. And so the great volume of, of the galaxy is actually defined by this region. And, and although the interesting things that people talk about now are in the star forming regions and the PDRs that produce them, that's not the most of the galaxy. It, it happens to be the most that some people can observe, but there are tracers then that we need to develop for the other things. So this is where it's going to be. And there's a few things there which, which are useful to us. There's oxygen there and hydrogen there. And we've heard e earlier uh, at the end of the afternoon how we might make OH out of it. Um, so we already know CO is not a good tracer for this stuff. And so we should be looking at an alternative. We need a second opinion, as if you were going to get a heart operation. Your doctor said you need an operation. You would surely go and get a second opinion. And so we're looking for a second opinion about this. And I think that OH does offer a lot of um, things that would be of interest there. Well, we'll let me skip over to this one, isn't it? Oh, yes. Another reason I think OH is useful, this is kind of a little bit of a cheat, this diagram. But I'm doing it to exaggerate the point. This shows the critical density on the x-axis and the transition energy on the y-axis. If you like, the critical density means that if material it is less than the critical density, that particular tracer won't show up very well. So carbon plus is characterized by relatively high critical densities. And you're going to see that tracer only in that case. CO is sort of in the middle, around of order 100 of that order. But OH is way down at the bottom here. So OH is a good one for the low density extended medium. That's the tracer of choice, I would claim. And it's easy to excite. You can see it's low on the y-axis, and so it's therefore easy uh, to excite it. It's like H1. Um. <clears throat> There's a few things about OH and surveys of the galaxy that people may not be aware of. Of course, um, the first extended survey of the galactic plane was done by Miller Goss in 1968 as part of his thesis. Um, and the extended OH emission was something Carl made tremendous contributions to, 
with Barry Turner in the seven in the seventies. Um, there were several unsuccessful attempts to carry out a blind survey for OH in the galactic plane that was done by Penzias himself in 1964 and Knapp and Kerr in 72. Uh, and there's several of us now are working on more of these blind OH surveys in uh, parts of the galaxy, which uh, I want to refer. So I'll just look at some very quick results here. This is um, the red arrow shows a direction of observation, this particular towards the outer galaxy. You can see that line of sight cuts through several spiral features, all of which show up, of course, in H1, which is the top right. We'll look at that top right set of panels there. That's H1 in the GBT. And you can see that, obviously, we're seeing the features of spiral structure as we march out in the galaxy that being spread out linearly in velocity there. So we're seeing local gas there. Um, we see then a sort of an interarm feature. And we see there um, uh, the Perseus arm. And there's uh, not sure what that, where that one belongs. And there's the outer arm in H1. Now we'll go back now and just look to remind you about what happens with OH. In, obviously, the local gas shows up well. That's the middle panel here, OH 1667. There's an interarm feature there, which is a narrow velocity. The Perseus arm shows up very clearly and cleanly here in OH, and is well separated uh, from uh, the other components. Um, and even this funny little thing, which doesn't seem to have a name, also does show up there. Uh, this particular cut doesn't show the outer arm, but we have seen the outer arm in other observations with the GBT. Um, perhaps another thing that's interesting is there's nothing funky about this stuff. It's in the LTE ratio. We have 1665 and 1667 data. It's not enhanced emission. It's, it's in purely in the 5 to 9 ratio. So. The, these, these are things which I, I wanted to uh, mention as a new tracer. And I think that's an area where uh, there should be more effort made in the coming years. So with this, I'd like to stop that part of the discussion. I should say that part of the presentation and open it up now for other suggestions. So we're here then to uh, get your thoughts. And if you're all tired, then we'll stop and drink. <laughs> Do we have a show of hands for stopping and drinking, or shall we go on? We should go on. They haven't had a discussion yet. OK. Who would like to start? <laughs> yes, OK. Good. Yeah, I don't know. Good. I, uh, I wasn't preparing, I was just uh, did not want to stop at this uh, point, uh, that's it. Uh, well, uh, I'm, um, uh, you know, very interested in the issues of magnetic field um, and turbulence uh, influencing the structure of uh, um, uh, the diffuse media, and I just want to know, maybe someone want uh, to comment on that. So I think um, Claire showed us something really nice, which was being able to compare the theory and the observation on equal footing in a way that was really powerful. Um, and so with this automated finder, right, you can apply it to you know, huge simulations, and that's great. Um, but a problem that we have in the morphological world is that you know, uh, Susan can tell us that we have uh, linear features, or um, someone else can tell us that we have shells. But it's very hard to say beyond that what the characteristics are. You know, phase space of the image plane is huge. There's lots and lots of information in there. So it's very hard to make a direct comparison. And we don't really know where the information lies in the image plane. You know, where, where are those, you know, a, a shell like Naomi was talking about? Where does that sit? What can we say that's, that's you know, truly informative to compare, say, a simulation where there is uh, feedback in a galaxy to a simulation where there's not feedback in a galaxy? You need some kind of tool. Um, so I think there needs to be an, um, sort of faster lines of communication where we can come together on what those metrics are. 
Um, because just saying, oh, wow, the interstellar medium is really filamentary, and somebody saying, ah, I have a simulation in which there are filaments or in which there are shells, uh, isn't enough. We need to do better than that. So what are these higher order statistics that you really can apply that are discriminatory between these different kinds of scenarios? Thanks. Uh, so I have a question uh, for observers. Uh, so we saw all these uh, very small scale structures that also changes rapidly and so on. Um, but um, did someone investigate the, the influence of selection effect? So how you are more likely to see small scale structures and um, how you are more likely to notice that they change rapidly? Selection effects, anyone? Anyone have a comment on that? Well, there was, I'm sorry, we're, we're not able to go in on that. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. There was another, I think you had, a con you had a question here. You had your hand raised, didn't you, a moment ago? So I have a comment about this distinguishing between filaments and, and shells, right? Obviously, you need new techniques there. Techniques should be morphological. So you were talking about the morphology of random fields, right? And in fact, there are such techniques. Uh, again, well, I, I, won't, I can mention our paper published last year, end of the last year in monthly notes, this is a letter about three-dimensional structure from a two-dimensional cross-section. It can be also projection. The point is that there is a morphological uh, quantifier called filamentarity or planarity, which was first introduced in cosmology to characterize the distribution of galaxies, large scale structure. It, it's based on what is called Minkowski functionals, which completely characterize the morphology of, for example, the random field. And no, no, it's a it, yes, it's it's a theory, a mathematical theory. No, no, it's random. Because it's turbulent, no. this means it's random. Do you want me to show you well, I saw quite a number of images, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and, and uh, it's, it's turbulent medium. It scales less than 100 parsecs. It is random. Hmm? Gas distribution is random. Velocity of field is random, right? Uh, at, at scales less than 100 parsecs, it is random. At scales larger than 100 parsecs, there are spiral arms, there is a disk structure, hello disk, and all this stuff. We are either talking about entirely different things, and this is the cause of, of misunderstanding. Uh, and, and, but then, still, it's, it's a complete description of morphology, random or not random. It's just mathematical theorem. There are four Minkowski functionals in three-dimensional space. So any other morphology characteristic can be expressed in terms of Minkowski functionals, to put it rigorously. Any, it's just mathematical theorem. It's difficult to argue with that. Uh, and then you, you, the disadvantage of Minkowski functionals is that they're dimensional. It's like volume, surface area, and so on. Then it was in, in, they were introduced dimensionless complexes of them called filamentarity and planarity. And uh, we looked at the probability distribution of polarity and filamentarity in the systems of randomly oriented triaxial ellipsoids. And we were surprised, we just stumbled upon that, that, that the probability distributions of the system of flat objects, like uh, uh, flat spheroids, is entirely different, very different, with a maximum of different positions, easily distinguishable from the system of, for example, narrow filaments. And we applied this to H1 survey of, of uh, its gas, I think, right, right from parks. And it seems that, I cannot be very confident, we only tried it very well, preliminary results, but it seems to indicate a filamentary, genuine filamentary structures seen at, at random positions, these filaments, when you say they are not random. 
This means you are confident, you know how they're oriented towards your line of sight. If you don't, they are random. The orientation is random of these filaments. It's exactly why the problem uh, arises. If, we, if it wasn't random, there would be no problem. Right? So it seems that there are some preliminary uh, indications that it, these are genuine in H1, at, at least the scale of hun uh, a few tens of parsecs, genuine filaments. Uh, it's only preliminary results, but there are tools. We have to think about new tools to characterize this very unusual, very non-Gaussian random medium. Sorry for the Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Enrique had comments. Oh, okay, well, yeah, addressing also the question on how to compare. I think the first thing is to realize that the ISM is not totally akin to what we understand as a turbulent flow, because one, there's energy injection sources at many different scales, and two, these energy injection sources have their signatures uh, on, on what the kind of structures that they produce in the gas. So we have uh, supernova remnants that tend to be uh, bubbles. We have some things that may make filaments. Uh, but so the question then, if you, if you want to apply some sort of statistical uh, uh, discriminator or diagnostic, maybe uh, you, it's going to either have to be tailored to some kind of specific process, uh, or you're going to have to get away from those particular signatures that have like a very specific origin. In other words, like in turbulence, we even forget about the spatial structure, right? Because we only look at phase space, uh, uh, sorry, at amplitude space with energy spectra. And so we totally dump uh, the, the spatial structure, which is in the, in the f uh, phases of the Fourier modes. So uh, yeah, so one thing is we, it, it's not clear that all these structures can be analyzed in a simple uh, statistical way, or it's going to be, it's going to have to be done w with some kind of structure in mind. Uh, so that that's common. Uh, That's actually not true. So we do find um, different spectral indexes in molecular medium, for example, which suggests that it's highly compressible. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the, both the velocity and the density power spectrum, it's not five-thirds. It's actually more consistent with uh, supersonic medium. But I, I wanted also to address Josh's point in terms of statistics. We actually, I think it's not just a problem of, of making better diagnostics or different statistics, it's also an issue of having additional tracers. Because I think it's kind of clear at this point that there's many different ways of getting a filament. Right? You could just have supersonic flows, you can get a filament, you can have highly magnetized medium and get a, ma a magnetized filament. You can have self-gravity that gives you filaments. And so I think your question was more on the lines of how can we distinguish these different modes of getting filaments? And I think for that to really move forward, we need additional tracers. So we need to know, is self-gravity important? We need to know the magnetic field strength. Um, and so in that sense, multiple diagnostics, including velocity information, rather than just looking at morphology, I think are going to be really important. Yes. So I wanted to ask, sort of related on this. I mean, I was very struck by the fibrous nature of the ISM. Um, and especially the correlation between the H1 fibers and the, the, um, the magnetic fields. So I tend to think of magnetic fields as stringy, and strings vibrate. So are there predictions from the models, um, or are there observations now that tell us what the velocity fields along fibers are? <laughs> well, actually, so you're working on it. Are there any people who do the models who would predict how these fibers would, would what the velocity fields of the fibers will be in advance of them fi figuring out what it looks like observationally? Mm -hmm. Aren't the predictions that the if the flowing along the field lines? Yeah, but, but are, are, fi are fibers the same as? <coughs> no, 
not, well, not, not at all. actually, it it depends because there's no such a thing as a model. Every time you roll the dice, you have a different ISM. So you have to do it with uh, MHD simulations. In MHD simulations, it depends on the kind of physics that you include. If you take a small box, you can create these fibers or filaments just by shear or by the colliding flows. Or if you enhance the, the resolution and the size of your simulation, you can get them, I don't know, out of multiple supernova explosions, shocks that come together. So there's multiple ways of doing those. Uh, you can have uh, many answers, just like uh, Blakesley was saying, and we're just missing the tracers. We don't know how to identify something that just collides uh, from something that is just gravitationally collapsing into, into that. So I think the simulations can produce anything <laughs> in that sense. Oh, but there's some folks on the other side of the aisle here who would like to have their word. Let's move over there. <laughs> I just want to build on what Josh said and what Blakesley said. I thought that one of them was going to say it, <clears throat> which is that the most critical thing in comparing the observations and the sophisticated simulations is actually the synthetic observations of the simulation. So yes, Blake, so we need more tracers, but from the simulations. So in other words, there are a lot of, of, of statistical tools and a lot of observations. Alex himself has done a lot of that work with Blakesley and we've done it. And uh, what we really need is, you know, Josh is gonna run this meeting. What's it called again, Josh? The meeting? And he just ran one called Mocking the, well, I guess that wasn't, it was you and a bunch of other people, it was called Mocking the Universe. And it was a whole meeting about making synthetic observations of these simulations. And it turns out that while the simulations are beautiful and morphologically look a lot like the interstellar medium, as far as I know, zero of them actually get it right um, in the statistical tests when you do make synthetic um, predictions about what would be observed as polarization or velocity flows when you can only measure the line of sight velocity or when you have a limited resolution. I could go on and on. So this is not a complaint. This is just a plea that would the people who are doing the simulations who have been increasing their effort to make um, more predictions of simulated observations just do more of that. See, there are people who haven't spoken yet. Well, yes, Isabel. Wait a moment. We'll get a, get a microphone to you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to push your point and, and know both from the observation point of view and from the simulation point, point of view, uh, to me, to answer whether we're dealing with sheets, fibers, filaments, collapsing filaments, and so on. Um, improving on, on traces or improving on density information is not going to help, uh, help us much in the near future because we are dealing with a very complex uh, uh, layer of, you know, multiple going from atomic to various molecules and va various uh, critical densities, various uh, sensitivities and, and emission properties. Even the dust is not linear anymore. So um, my feeling is that uh, the velocity is a pure tracer somewhere because you know you just measure velocity so my question would be on the observation point of view um, when do we think or how soon do we think we can go to really sub kilometer per second resolution both in the h1 and in co and from the simulation point of view how far down can you go in kilometers per second anybody have an answer for that yeah well Comments here for Alyssa. We've been at sub kilometer per second resolution for, for decades. And uh, the, the more resolution does, doesn't really help. Um, what, what helps, again, is some kind of prediction of what you would see in these line of sight velocity observations. Because we, I, I don't want to go into it, but we can have all the resolution in the world, and that, that doesn't help. Um, you know, I mean, you have to have enough, but I'm saying we already have enough. And um, tomorrow, I wasn't going to show this, but, but I will now. Um, uh, there was a very unfortunate paper that was three years of a PhD thesis by Chris Beaumont, who also wrote the glue software that many of you like. So he did something good for astronomy, too. But he basically did an analysis um, of how well position, 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 real space matches up to position, position, velocity space using various CO tracers. And the answer is absolutely terribly. Um, and the um, burial parameter that's used so frequently, unfortunately, is 
is almost meaningless um, in position, position, velocity, and space. And this is incredibly depressing. Um, and, and so it's much better when you have tracers that are rare, and, and then you can match up features, maybe like the H1 example that we saw earlier this afternoon. But unfortunately, in the molecular world, I can't speak so much to the atomic world, but in the molecular world, we've had that kind of velocity resolution forever. I mean, I, I, I think that besides tracers, um, the, all, the other thing that we need is to really uh, correlate the different length scales that are associated. I mean, one thing that I'm getting from this session is about the diffuse scale, the diffuse gas, is that I didn't know anything about. Because as I'm going to show in my talk on Thursday, usually what, especially what we get with ALMA, is really the compact stuff, the things that have already collapsed. So knowing the whole history and knowing what's happening at the different length scales, and from the scales in which the gas is start being, uh, I mean, somehow, uh, uh, you know, accumulated to form all these structures, I think is something that, that, that we should all know how that actually happened. And, and that means talking across all these disciplinary different fields. Interestingly enough, velocity is uh, much more robust if we are talking about uh, statistics. Even in the case when we have uh, substantial changes in uh, density, we still have a nice, uh, for example, power spectrum of velocity, and it's much uh, less uh, changing from uh, media to media. Uh, moreover, uh, velocity is very important because it creates caustics in uh, uh, the PPV space, and uh, as Alisa mentioned, uh, this can uh, uh, create a lot of uh, confusion. I was really impressed, uh, however, um, uh, that uh, probably these filaments uh, may not be this velocity. At least it was my uh, discussion with the speaker uh, gave to me, but uh, this is something which uh, must be explored. As for the increase of uh, the resolution, well, uh, if we are not going to very uh, heavy species, I think we don't go uh, too far because we have uh, the line width, uh, uh, which is a thermal line width, uh, and uh, well, we can have uh, use iron uh, to study <laughs> interstellar media, but otherwise it's not uh, uh, so um, uh, useful. I think I think, uh, for example, for H1, we have all the resolution that uh, we can have. Uh, well, yeah, I wanted to go back to to, uh, to Robert's, to Bob's question about uh, the filaments and whether we have kinematic sin signatures. Yes, we do, but in non-magnetic simulations. <laughs> so uh, the thing is that filaments and perhaps many other types of structures, like, like holes, H1 holes, for example, may have different origins. Uh, so not all filaments are created equal. Equal. I'm pretty sure about that. I'm pretty sure that uh, Susan's fibers are completely different from the Herschel uh, filaments. And uh, perhaps some of those may have a magnetic origin, or maybe not. No? Uh, I tend to believe that filaments in molecular clouds do have a gravitational origin, but that's my personal bias. So perhaps the thing to do is that uh, I don't even know whether we're ready to go ahead and compare simulations to observations, because I don't think the theoreticians agree on uh, a mechanism or what are the what is the suite of mechanisms that can produce a given type of structure. For example, uh, if you ask Paolo Paduan, he'll tell you that it's supersonic turbulence forming uh, filaments. If you ask me, I'll tell you it's gravity. And I liked very much uh, Susanna's explanation of these folded uh, sheets for creating the diffuse fibers. Um, so perhaps what we need at, at the beginning is like galactic scale simulations or kiloparsec scale simulations with sufficient ingredients to give us like a garden variety of objects that we see in the simulations. And then we go ahead and apply uh, uh, these synthetic observations and and then perhaps the way to apply statistics is to see whether we see the same fraction of objects of different kinds in uh, simulations and in observations and that means that we have to be able to tell the different kind of kinds of objects observationally as well because uh, I'm not sure that we could 
tell uh, observationally whether if I show you uh, this is a question for you uh, guys <laughs> uh, if if you see an image of a f of a filament of in the H1 or in molecular clouds for example would you be able to tell that they have different signatures or or uh, trademarks that could distinguish different origins for them and so we need to do that both in the observational camp and in, in the numerical camp and then we can go ahead and do statistics to test populations or something like that yeah I, I wanted to make a uh, comment about the uh, the fibers uh, there I think there's a, a tendency or at least a temptation I feel it that when I look at one of those fibers, it looks like it's, it is kind of filamentary. Uh, and then you imagine a three-dimensional filament. Uh, the problem is that we actually know what the density of the interstellar medium is. And you cannot take all the mass along a line of sight and put it in one of those filaments. Uh, similarly, if you look at the uh, map, we uh, saw that the magnetic field orientation uh, agrees uh, very well with the lineup of these uh, filaments. And it's known that the uh, magnetic field that we see in the optical polarization, uh, that's the uniform component of the field. That's a small part of the total field, as uh, Carl and Tom have shown. And so what we're seeing is an integral of the field structure along you know, a kiloparsec line of sight. And correspondingly, uh, the gas is also spread out over that kiloparsec line of sight. And I uh, don't understand how I can you know, look along a kiloparsec and then see narrow transverse uh, uh, features uh, along that. But I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I thought that the idea that they were folded sheets was very interesting. I think that you, uh, you Carl, showed that if you look along a line of sight, a lot of the gas is concentrated in sheets, in thin sheets, and sometimes they would be seen edge on. But of course, if they're very thin, most of the time they would not be seen edge on. So an interesting question for the observers is when you look at this fibrous structure, what fraction of the mass of the uh, interstellar medium is actually located in those uh, fibers? I'm getting uh, arrows from the organizers. It's 6 o'clock. I would like to give the last word to Josh Peake so Yay. Talk about his stuff. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say, Chris, mostly we're looking at high latitude where we're not looking through many kiloparsecs. Mostly it's small stuff. And we do, we're able to distinguish it in velocity space. So it's not just the whole integral along the line of sight. If you're looking in the plane, everything goes to hell, sure. Um, I guess the, the one thing that I would kind of put as a takeaway, something to compare it to what Alyssa was saying, you know, we can take, build these huge data cubes um, and compare them to each other and say, wow, this, here's a big data cube and here's a big data cube. But what we found is it's very hard to learn anything qualitatively. You know, our friends in galaxy formation, they say, well, what's the mass metallicity relation? It's a single number. Um, and everybody tries to compare to that number. And we don't have that. We don't have that number. Um, and we, we've, we've been trying. I know Blake's Lee's done a lot of work with this, with Alex, trying to build these numbers. Um, but I think we need more communication in terms of putting those numbers together that we can you know, really all strive to, to work together to, to find something useful and true. I think we should give a round of applause to all the speakers and to Carl and, and to Dick for bringing us here. And now we can drink, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> it's all yours. Thank you.